Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. Today we're going to be talking about SmackDown from June 2nd, 2023. Now, before we get into SmackDown, which has put the bloodline back on top, we were doing a good job there. It's back. All right. The energy is back. I like it. But we got to talk about some news and notes first. Not much, you know, not a lot to discuss, really. Uh, but let's put it out there. That Ronda Rousey, she was the one who pushed for her tag team championship. And uh, Shayna Baszler says that she went into the office and sort of demanded it. And that it was put off for a while. Um, But eventually, when Liv Morgan got injured, they decided to go for it. Uh, Ronda Rousey being interested and taking a great amount of interest in what she does on television is something that is actually inspiring. Okay, she's not doing good stuff. Let's put it like that. I'm going to be honest. She's not doing anything good, but at least she's involved. You know, she's not sleepwalking through her WWE run, which is what I thought she was doing. I thought she didn't really give a damn and that she was basically just taking whatever they whatever comes and just riding out the contract. But it seems that she's legitimately involved in what she does on tv and wants to be this is like the second or third time i've heard that ronda rousey actually went into the office and made something happen the first time was when she dropped the title to liv morgan that was actually her idea and um it, i don't think it was her idea to get it back but <laughs> you know you can't you can't change that too much but um so it's nice to see that ronda actually cares uh, hopefully she actually works as hard at getting better now the second note actually ties into the first, which is actually is very interesting to me because I've seen that boxing champion Clarissa Shields actually wants to do WWE. And um, she has been talking about this. She talked about it on Max Kellerman's show. She's talked about it on an MMA show. She's been doing various different things because boxing has kind of gotten boring. And that was kind of her, her rationale for you know she's at the top of her game now she started making more money than ever but she doesn't have a lot of opponents left in boxing so now she's looking at mma and wwe i think she's already done mma and she says that she wants to do wwe now here's the interesting thing clarissa shields is from flint michigan and SummerSlam is actually in detroit and she and she will be fighting in detroit at little caesar's arena some at some point soon it's women's boxing. I mean, who really gives a damn, but it's a, it's a big deal. It's something WWE can hang their hat on. And I said to myself, what would be, and she wants to be a tag team partner with Bianca Belair. So what could be cooler than Clarissa Shields versus Ronda Rousey? Now, neither one of them are, I don't know what Clarissa Shields like. It would be like as a wrestler. But a MMA champion versus a boxing champion in a tag team match could actually do business. All right. That's something that I think could be very interesting. And I would, if you're Triple H and he's a mark for like the legitimate athlete type of deal, this is something that you try to make happen. Yes, you have the Olympic gold medalist female wrestler whose name I can never remember, uh, Mensa, um, that young lady. But I don't think she's ready yet. Um, but if Clarissa Shields is willing to get in there and take bumps, how do you not do Bianca Belair and Clarissa Shields versus Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler? How do you not do that for SummerSlam? That sounds like fun. You know, I I would do that because you have imagine the ESPN coverage of Ronda Rousey and Clarissa Shields being in the same match. You know, you could do the best woman ever in MMA, even though it's a work versus the best woman ever in boxing, which might actually be legitimate, but it's more than likely a work. And it's two big names in their respective sports. And you have Baszler, who is a pretty good pro wrestler and Bianca Belair, who's a pretty good pro wrestler. And you could put them in there and they could lead the match. Of course, Clarissa Shields not going to know what the fuck she's doing, but you could put her in there, give her the hot tag. She can learn how to take a couple of bumps. And WWE has been doing a good job in terms of actually utilizing celebrities. Now, Clarissa Shields isn't really a celebrity, but she's a sports figure. 
And it could actually uh, benefit her quite a bit to do this. It helped uh, Floyd Mayweather. If it didn't, <laughs> if nothing else, it helped his pocketbook. But I can tell you ESPN will be all over this. There will be a lot of people who will be on top of this in terms of so from a promotional perspective. It's a big move that you can do. It's easy. It costs you little to nothing. And the risk is very low because it's a, it's a women tag team match. So really, if you don't care, if you didn't care about women's tag team matches anyway, then you're not going to care about this. But if you are interested in the freak show factor of it, like how could she really perform in a wrestling ring? You might be, me might be okay with this. And I'm already for it. I'm already in, you know, I'm a freak show spectacle kind of guy, you know, Within reason, of course, like I've seen the, the giant panda in Japan, that's too much. All right. You know, when you wrestling giant pandas, that's, that's insane. I don't want anything to do with that, but you want to bring a boxer into the wrestling ring. Okay. Perfectly fine. I'm okay with that. There was a movie star at the first WrestleMania. So I'm okay with Clarissa Shields. If she wants to jump in the ring, be a tag team partner to Bianca Belair and they fight Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler. I'm cool with that. I think that would be great. And if she actually does well there, you could do a Ronda Rousey versus Clarissa Shields match at WrestleMania. That could be fun too. If, but she'd have to prove herself in the tag team match first. And so I'm 100% cool with this. And I think that from a promotional perspective is something WWE needs to bite on almost immediately. Why waste time and do it in her hometown too? Like it's, you know, well, Detroit is the closest you're going to get to Flint and she's from Flint. So, um, I say go for it. Now I forgot about this. So this is going to be edited into the video somehow. All right. So Dave Meltzer, uh, put out an article where he talked about WWE in AEW and the venues. So I'm going to paraphrase because I don't want to, I didn't, I don't read the observer, of course, but apparently WWE has in these contracts that the venues cannot host AEW within weeks before or after WWE shows. And they cannot promote AEW shows until after WWE has had their shows and people have lost their minds over this. But this is what's called a radius clause. It isn't typical of any entertainment business. A radius clause in a contract is a statement that a big venue, let's say Coachella, who also has a radius clause. Now, this is why they, I, I get ag aggravated with Dave Meltzer, because he could easily look this up and explain it to people in ways that make more sense. It is a way of protecting your uh, your show, essentially. If you have a show and you say you're going to have a show in Detroit, you don't want somebody to have a show in, let's say, the same city at around the same time because it's going to split your audience. So what they do is they get some kind of assurance from the arena or sometimes from the performers. If it's uh, if it's Coachella, it's usually from the performers that they're not going to perform or host any shows within a general amount of time and a general area that will prevent them from being able to maximize their business. Now um, it's perfectly legal because both sides have to agree to it. So it's not like WWE can force arenas to not do business with AEW. Basically they just ask the arena, Hey, if you're going to do business with AEW, make sure that it is not within a time that's going to split our business. Um, WWE has had problems with this before. They talked about it during WrestleMania where um, these companies would try to leech onto WrestleMania by hosting shows in the same area. Um, and they would take away merchandise sales. They would take away ticket sales, etc. cetera, um, by leeching. Now, some people will say, is Lee is a fair? Yes, you can leech if you want to. It's like, sure. But it's also Lee's a fair if I can make a deal with the venue to block you from being uh, pushed here, at least at, the, at this particular time. You have to realize that every SmackDown and Raw and pay-per-view is a collaborative effort between WWE and the venue. Anything that could affect WWE, they don't want to occur. It would definitely benefit the venue if they could promote both WWE and AEW at the same time. But considering they are similar products, 
you could split WWE's business and actually actively harm your business partner if you promote or allow a business in the same venue to operate at the same time. They're saying that AEW has to basically create their own uh, hype. You're not allowed to ride off of our wave. This is something that, of course, again, like I said, WWE has been doing dealing with this when it comes to WrestleMania, and everybody wants to have a show WrestleMania weekend in the same time as WWE. That sort of trying to treat WWE and WrestleMania like a big festival, but there's a limited amount of money in that area. Yes, they're pulling people in from all over the world and stuff like that, but if somebody decides to go to a, let's just say like it's 2017 or something like that and Ring of Honor is running, if somebody decides to go to the Ring of Honor show, they're not buying tickets to NXT. They're not paying for merchandise. They're not doing this and doing that. And so you're definitely going to look at it and say, how much of that can you possibly control? And you should, because big entertainment companies understand that smaller entertainment companies are looking to leech and latch on to them. This is why Coachella does it. This is why Bonnaroo does it. This is why, you know, um, other teams do it. Hell, even sports teams do it. You know, it's a thing that is not that over the top. But since so many people are ignorant, they don't, they don't even know how to look things up. If you look something up, you can learn about it. You know, they've been talking about Coachella doing this stuff and other music festivals for a long time. But, but Coachella puts it on the, on the artist. They have a radius clause that, that goes onto the artist. So if you're doing, let's say Coachella in, uh, let's say Detroit, then the artist is not going to take shows in Flint or in Columbus, Ohio, or somewhere that's in a close proximity to Detroit, because then people can say, Oh, I don't need to go to Detroit to see, uh, Rihanna. I'll just wait till she comes to Flint and then it'll be a cheaper show. And you can go see Rihanna there. So somebody's going to say, well, no, you can't do this. We're going to have a, a what's called a, it's called a radius clause. If the show is in Detroit, then no shows in Columbus or Flint or Ann Arbor or anywhere else that's going to affect our show. So that, cause it's a business venture between the artist and the venue and the, the, the brand Coachella. It's the exact same thing with WWE. If WWE is running Little Caesars Arena, it is a business venture between Little Caesars Arena and WWE. If AEW wants to run Little Caesars Arena, to allow them to run the very next night is going to hurt both WWE and AEW. So it actually does AEW a good credit too because it's not allowing them to run the same venues at the exact same time. It's not exhausting the finances of that area. And it's an, it's not even an exclusivity contract, which some people thinks it is. It's not, it's basically an agreement that during this particular time that our business is running, we don't want you to do business with anybody else in this particular time. And it works out for all sides involved. Now, Dave Meltzer, if he knew anything about the entertainment business, if he was a real entertainment journalist, which he's not, he's neither a sports journalist nor an entertainment journalist, which is crazy because either one of them could have told you about a radius clause and how it's perfectly legal and how you can bitch and moan and whine about it. But ultimately, people care more about WrestleMania and Coachella than they do about uh, you having some kind of leech television show or some kind of backyard again wrestling promotion that's leeching off of WrestleMania. They care more about that than because you want to maximize the amount of money you can make off a of Raw or a SmackDown being televised in your area, then splitting the audience, hurting your business here. And because then what? You know, let's say you d- you decide to not sign the radius clause and you hurt WWE's business because you allow AEW or some other wrestling promotion to promote at the same time a cheaper product. Uh, And okay, so now that does a great job for AEW, but now WWE decides never to come back again. How in the long term does that really benefit you? Again, if if Dave Meltzer was an entertainment journalist or a sports journalist, he would already know this stuff and he would be able to explain it to people in a lot clearer fashion. You don't have to like it, but that's probably why 
your your uh town has a sports team and another town doesn't <laughs> you know why you only have one sports team in the entire city while new york has four or whatever and that's just the nature of the beast you can not like it if you want but that's just how it is and i'm sorry to break it to you but this is there's nothing uh scandalous about this at all and if any of these people were entertainment journalists or sports journalists they would look this up and see if it's legal and then be able to explain to people why it's happening and why it's a benefit to both companies because it is a benefit to aew as well because they can run these shows and they can make their nuts without having wwe slide in either the day after or the day before and steal their audience you know it's just a lot easier to do business this way when everybody basically gets their own little block of time and space. It's just easier to do it this way. And most people have been arguing WWE is a monopoly. Look at what they're doing. It's like you have to look at things from more than one direction, but that's all in the framing. This is how they frame it. They frame it as WWE is doing this to AEW rather than WWE and the venue have made a decision that to maximize the profits of a Raw or SmackDown or whatever program they're doing, even if it's just a house show, they're not going to run similar products at the same time. It's, would you do that? All right. <laughs> you know, would you open a Burger King right across the street from another Burger King? No. So why would you, <laughs> would you open a McDonald's across the street from a Burger King? No. So why would you run two wrestling shows essentially back to back at almost the exact same time? It wouldn't make sense to do that. You'll be hurting your audience and you'll be hurting your business in doing so. So that's what the radius clause does. These people are retarded. Let's get back to SmackDown. Let's get into SmackDown. So SmackDown started with a video package with Roman Reigns 1000 days. Um, I like that it was a wonderful touch that they not only noticed the wwe champions but also the nwa champions the wcw champions and it really put roman over strong like everybody who was you know oh they showed cm punk in a video package it's like so what they showed dick hutton in this in this video package and most of you don't even know who he is right they had a young Terry Funk in this video package. That's the kind of stuff that made me smile. I was like, oh my God, they're comparing Roman's run to, to Terry Funk, <laughs> to Dory Funk Jr. <laughs> they're comparing his title run to NWA world champions. They're, they're blowing it out of proportion. Sting, when he was, uh, I think it was, I think it was, uh, was it NWA world champion? <laughs> it was on there. Like this was, this was excellent. You know, it was very well done with the clips and everything. It was excellent. It was fantastic. It was one of my favorite, my second favorite video package that they've done on Roman Reigns. The first one still being, um, the video package that led into Night of Champions, uh, his match with Jey Uso. That was my favorite video package probably that WWE has ever done. Um, I love that video package. I love it so much. This is probably second in terms of the bloodline video packages. So it was tremendous. And they show clips throughout the night of Roman Reigns, 1000 days. All right. So Heyman, of course, goes to Solo Sokoa. He wants tonight to be a very special night for Roman Reigns. He wants to make sure that the Usos are nowhere in sight. He does not want Solo's brothers there at all. He then goes to Adam Pierce, who, to my recollection, promised him that security would make sure that the Usos were not on the show. And, of course, none of that mattered because the Usos were on the show. But, first, Triple H came out there. Once in a generation, uh, athletes uh, change the face of their respective sports. Uh, Wayne Gretzky in hockey. Uh, Michael Jordan in basketball. Uh. And then he got to pro wrestling and saying they're watching a generational talent in Roman Reigns. Roman comes out there and Triple H uh, delivers to him the official commemorative WWE Universal Championship, which is the same design in a different color. It's the same belt in a different color. Somebody on the internet 
very intelligently noted that WWE has unveiled this very same design at least four times. All right, when they first had the first WWE championship, when they got rid of the spinner belt, it was a scratch logo with the WWE. And uh, that was the one that The Rock carried right after the spinner belt was uh, tossed out. Then they changed it from that to what the universal belt looks like with the very sharp W's. And then the WWE championship is the same thing. Then, of course, the women's titles or whatever, the red belt, the blue belt, and now the gold belt. Now, we're we're talking about Roman Reigns' championship and what this means. Because he still had the two belts that he had, and now he's got the gold belt, too. There's just a rainbow of belts. It's like the Green Lantern Corps. Is somebody going to have a green belt next? A purple belt? Next? Well, they had a purple belt. They got rid of it. Um, <laughs> What next? Pink belts? Uh, I don't mind the white belts. I don't mind the black belts. I don't mind certain belts with certain colors to denote the show that they're going to be on. I don't mind that too much. But the big, the big W in gold is very weird. All right. It's, it's really a letdown, especially considering they, it, it would been, it's been teased all week. They're going to have a new championship. It's going to be a new title. And everybody's like, yes, they're finally getting rid of the big W. And then you see the big W. In gold, and you're like, what? What did that? Why they do that? It's 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 retarded. Now, before we get into the, before we continue with this, uh, with this story, the the championship is called the WWE Universal Championship, or the undisputed WWE Universal Championship. So people are leading to ask the question: What happened to the WWE title? Is this the new name? For the WWE Championship, um, or the WWF Championship, or the WWWF Championship, um, is it a new lineage? Has the has that old title been dissolved? What's happening when Roman fused the titles together? He, of course, fused the WWE Championship into the Universal Title, but since he hasn't lost yet, we don't know whether. This is going to be one title or two titles. Now we're seeing that it's one title because now it's one belt recognizing both titles. But the black belt is the world title. That is the WWE championship, the number one title in the history of the industry. Yes, even more important than the NWA title because more people know what the WWE is and they don't know what the NWA is. Historical value matters, but that's the only reason why the NWA title will even be on that level. So when you look at how you can, you're truly deciding to rebrand this title, having the word universal in there is really making me raise my eyebrow because a lot of people are like, the WWE championship is gone. And I'm like, I don't know about that yet. I have gone on record as saying this shit is not worth watching. If they re if they get rid of the WWE title, if they get rid of it, it's not worth watching. All right, um, that's that's going to be like a line that you can cross that you can never come back from. All right, it's one thing to have these various world heavyweight titles and the universal title and all these other bullshit titles. The WWE Championship cannot be that should be like the golden grail. You can't you can screw around with the design, but you can't screw around with the lineage. All right, you you just you can't you can't just say we're gonna we're gonna uh, take the title off the you know, deactivate it for four years or something like that. Because at that point you're cutting yourself off from history to a degree that you can't go back from. Now it would be interesting considering that the entire WWE championship would be the entirety of the McMahon family. And then as soon as they sell to, to Endeavor, all of a sudden the WWE title doesn't exist anymore. Because the McMahon family don't run the company anymore. So it would be symbolic in that way. But it would be, as a wrestling fan, it would be very, very uh, offensive to me. So I'm not sure what they're doing in terms of the lineage of that title yet. But I'm guessing Roman Reigns is a thousand days the Universal Champion. Not a thousand days WWE Champion. That should be noted, right? So... I'm guessing that this title is basically just a symbol of his universal title run. 
It has nothing to do with his WWE championship run. And maybe they'll actually retire the universal title once Roman loses. And it will just be the WWE championship again, which is what I'm hoping because it doesn't make sense to celebrate a thousand days of him being the WWE champion because he hasn't been WWE champion a thousand days. He's only been universal champion a thousand days. So given, given being given the gold belt is representative of a higher level of the blue belt that he has. It doesn't affect the black belt at all. So I'm, I'm hoping that's the case and they need to clear that up, but I'm pretty sure I'm very sure. In fact, that when he does lose it, if he ends up losing it to Cody, that Cody's probably just going to dump the universal title and keep the WWE championship. And it's probably going to be a new title that's going to be uh, introduced. Uh, well, actually, physical new belt that's going to be introduced. Um, so I'm okay with that. But I'm really on the fence about the WWE championship and where it fits in all this nonsense. Because it's been on the back burner as everybody talks about his 1,000 days. That's 1,000 days with the toy belt. You know, the universal title that's only been around since 2016. Who cares? You know, <laughs> who really gives a shit? But the WWE championship, it actually matters. I don't know what, how many days he's had the WWE title. It's been over a year. So it's like, uh, let's do a quick Google 425 days. All right. So that's still a significant WWE championship reign. So. Um, to commemorate his universal title reign, 1,000 days, they're probably going to retire the universal title, hopefully. When uh, Roman loses it, he'll be champion emeritus or whatever the hell, who cares? And the WWE title will continue its lineage when Roman loses. That's my hope. If they're going to just keep this belt as one fused title, that's going to be the WWE Universal Championship forevermore. <sighs> talk about me and mad at triple h i already don't not a big fan but uh getting rid of that wwe championship would be one of the biggest slaps in the face we would have dealt with in a long time all right so now back to the story uh roman reigns has his celebration in the ring uh triple h gives him the gold belt roman likes the gold belt he loves it he, he just likes it because it's his of course then the usos come out there because security nobody tries to stop them nobody cares they get in the ring and then <laughs> Roman demands that Jay kick Jimmy in the face. He says that Jimmy kicked him in the face. Therefore, Jay has to kick Jimmy. And he's, he keeps yelling at Jay to fix this. Fix it. So Jay is pacing because that's what he does. He's, he's constantly hesitating, not really making a move. Jimmy says that Roman is the one who needs fixing. And that he did this because he was being a brother. And says that Roman has not been a good brother. And that uh, what he did was he was protecting his brothers. He's, he's Jay Uso's brother. He's got his back. He's his brother. He loves Solo. Solo is his brother. He's going to protect Solo too. Then he tells Solo that Roman is going to use him, manipulate him, and then toss him to the side too. Uh, Roman says that Jimmy is speaking for everybody like he's the tribal chief. He's an imposter. I'm the real tribal chief and that he's talking like solo doesn't have his own voice. He said, let's hear from solo. He gives the mic to solo solo acknowledges Roman reigns as his tribal chief, but the use Usos are his brothers. So he sides with the Usos and Roman goes through this whole heartbreak and head in his hands. And he's very upset Jamie said that they can continue to run things as the bloodline, but they have to do so in respect with respect and not basically under Roman's boot. Then Roman got in Jimmy's face and Jimmy shoved him in the face. Now Jay is pissed. Jay gets in between them and is like, what are you doing? Like, what is going on? What are you doing? So Jay is saying that everybody has to stay together, that they're family, that they're stronger together. And Jimmy said that Roman is his brother too. Roman is his family, but he's not backing down on this. They only do this with respect. So Roman is mentally, he's like, oh man, what am I going to do? He's wiping tears away and 
he hugs Jimmy and Jimmy hugs him and Jay is in he's in the shot. He's leaning over the ropes. He's like, whew, dodged a bullet. Praise be whatever Samoan gods they pray they pray to. And they're like, whew. <laughs> whew. And then Roman says, no. And everybody's like, wait a minute, what does that mean? So Jimmy pulls back and solo spikes Jimmy. And everybody is pissed. Jay is flummoxed. He's back there just flabbergasted. He doesn't know what to do. His little brother has turned on him. And Jimmy is down for a while. He wasn't down that long. You know, they do a good job of uh, of the symbolism of being attacked is worse than the attack itself. And Jay is like, what? How could you do that? Like, how, how? So Solo and Roman, they leave the ring with Paul Heyman. And Paul, off mic, just very loudly asks, what about Jay? My tribal chief, what about Jay? So Roman says Jay is going to do what he always does. And that's fall in line. So this was, this was really good stuff. This was really good stuff. I like this. This was good shit. You know, um, Jimmy being the, the, the strong member of the Usos, the one, this is how they introduced him when he came into the story, uh, as the one who was nobody's bitch, he wasn't going to back down, but he still does care about his family. And so he gave Roman an opportunity to, you know, make amends that Roman has to treat them as equals that we're all brothers. It's not one of us is better than the other. We're not your underlings. We're not your foot soldiers. We protected you because we're your family, not because we're your goons, you know? And Roman still sees them as goons. Like, this is what you guys, this is your lot in life, is to be beneath me. And Solo was introduced into the story as the sort of bodyguard of Roman Reigns. I don't know if you remember that. When he was, uh, he was sent by the elders to sort of handle these situations in which Roman uh, couldn't trust the Usos. And so he played his role perfectly. Him turning on his brothers, of course, was necessary in order to prolong this story. Because when he joined the Usos, at first I was like, how do you continue this story if all three of them are on one side and then it's just Roman by himself? I was thinking, okay, Roman about to lose the title sooner than I thought. If uh, we're about to have all three of Rikishi's sons against Roman, that's uh, that's an issue that's a problem <laughs> okay but they went back switched it i was like okay perfect we're going back to the way i thought it was going to be so now the pay-per-view is going to end up being i'm guessing money in the bank roman and solo versus the usos as the main event and i think that's great now of course it puts jay in the middle because jay is the gohan of this story He's the one that everybody is waiting to make a decision. You know, Sami Zayn believes in Jay Usto. Jimmy believes in Jay. The only one who doesn't really believe in Jay is Roman because he mentally broke Jay already. You know, Jay is already, you know, a well-whipped dog, at least in, in Roman's perspective. But Jay was the first one to challenge him. When he started getting on this, this nonsense, it was Jay who was the first one who's fought against Roman. So everybody sees that Jay has the potential to be the guy, but he's waffling. He's going through this. This has been too much for him because he's trying to balance the family, the issue, you know, the loyalty of family versus of general family versus the loyalty of your actual brothers. And, um, he it's, it's paralysis by analysis where it's just going to be weeks of Jimmy of Jay doing nothing because he can't make a decision between his brother and his cousin. When, you know, in real, in reality, of course, you are probably side more with your brother, especially since your cousin is a dickhead, but it makes for great drama because you're building to the moment where Jay is the one who attacks Roman. And when Jay is the one who is going to go overboard, and fight Roman again. You know, they, they tried this before. 
We haven't uh, tried it since the bloodline officially started. So that's what we're waiting on here. But the the matches are going to be very interesting because they're going to have to see that Jay is going to fight at least. He's got to fight either Roman or he's got to fight Solo. So which one is he going to fight when he's eventually tagged into this tag team match? Jay can't just say, I'm not in, you know, and he, he can't, he has to have Jimmy's back, right? Either that, or he decides to play the middle and not get involved and not agree to the tag team match, which would of course be a betrayal of Jimmy. It helps Roman. If he does nothing, it helps solo. If Jimmy, if Jay does nothing, it only helps Jimmy if Jay gets involved. So Jay has to make a decision. His decision has to be to side with Jimmy. So at that point, we could have the two on two match, which could be fun, but it's going to create a new situation in which Jay has to fight his blood brother being Solo Sokoa. So this is very interesting. I, I like this. This is a really good storyline. It's the best thing in wrestling again. For a couple of weeks there, they were stuck in the sludge of Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens and all that kind of stuff. But now they're they're back on top. They're doing good angles. They're doing good storytelling. The character work is working out. Um, Jay is still the highlight of this thing. Him being back outside of the shot, but, you know, reacting to everything, reacting to everything somebody says, the big moments, you actually are looking to Jay <laughs> to see how he's responding, even though he's not front and center. He's off to the side, but you feel what Jay is feeling. If you're a Bloodline fan, when they started hugging Jimmy and Roman, you were relieved too. So Jay is relieved. Whew, you're relieved too. But then when when Solo betrays Jimmy, you feel betrayed too. But you're, then things, of course, become a little bit more individual because Jay can't just run up on Solo. You know, there's... There's something there. We have to continue to work that out. So the Bloodline Soap Opera, fantastic. Really good show. Was the best stuff on the show, as it usually is. So it's, it was tremendous. No, no, Nothing more could be said about that. Now, to our regularly scheduled SmackDown, which was, oh my goodness. Austin Theory and Pretty Deadly defeat the Brawl and Brutes. Austin Theory did a segment with the Brittany Deadly uh, just a couple of seconds before this match. Talked about calling himself the greatest United States champion of all time. Of course, bragging about beating John Cena. Said that he might be United States champion forever. And when you're this great, people want to be a part of it. Then Pretty Deadly came out. They have a new theme song, which I absolutely hate. I, there was nothing wrong with the NXT theme. Nothing. This seems like this is the third theme that they've had so far. I don't know what's going on, man. Maybe I'll like it if I could understand the lyrics, but I I I just instantly got sour when I heard that they, they had a new theme. So uh, let's put let's put to be determined on my, even though I'm generally leaning negative on all new themes. Uh, pretty deadly, get on the microphone and call the brawl and bruise gremlins, <laughs> which is which is excellent. Um, then they have this match. This match is entirely too long. This match seemed to go on literally forever. Uh, Austin Theory and Pretty Deadly win the match. Uh, okay. Jesus Christ. Can we can we shorten these matches up, please? Especially this, this kind of stuff. I get that Austin Theory needs reps. Pretty Deadly needs exposure. But come on. This match is entirely too long, bro. Uh, today is AJ Styles' birthday. He turned 46 years old. AJ Styles is 46 years old. What? Wow. Wow. You know, just imagine in the new generation era, Vince was trying to get rid of anybody who was old, which, which is not entirely true because he brought back Bob Backlund. But AJ Styles is 46 and is still a full time roster member. You would think he would be part timer by now. Full time roster member. He is a freak of nature. This AJ Styles. He's almost as freak as much of a freak of nature as Rey Mysterio. You know these two guys, man, are still going in their mid forties. Got to take your hat off to him. It's a new generation of athlete. And I saw a video 
uh, or I don't know if it was a video or an article about athletes now lasting longer in their respective fields than they used to. And one of the examples was LeBron James being 38, still playing at a high level in the NBA. Now, part of that was because they don't think the NBA tests for steroids or human growth hormone and that kind of stuff, which I don't know whether they do or don't. But um, ultimately, uh, we know that Rey Mysterio does the stem cells, um, which I don't know if it's even legal in other sports. Is stem cells legal in like the NFL or the NBA or boxing or anything like that? I don't know. But you have to say like these guys are lasting longer in these sports now than they usually do. A 46 year old 30 years ago would have been retired. You know, it would have been just can't handle this anymore. But AJ still being able to perform like he did last week at Night of Champions at 46. Tremendous. Got to give the guy credit. Happy birthday to the phenomenal one. He apologized to the OC, which almost made me puke, for falling short on uh, winning the world title. But then it says that uh, he asked them if they had heard Hit Row's diss record on them. And I was like, diss record? So I go to Twitter and I look at Top Dollar, uh, Flop Dollar, AJ Francis, and he had a diss record on AJ Styles and the OC. This guy dropped a AJ Styles diss record on AJ Styles' birthday. And the diss record says, quote, the name AJ, oh yeah, that's me, got more phenomenal style than you see each week. Bruh, mid-row needs to stop it. All right. They need to stop, stop them. They need to be stopped in their tracks. So this leads to a tag team match. Gallows and Anderson versus mid row. I'm sorry. Hit row. Um, it, Gallows and Anderson came out to AJ Styles theme song, which is great. Instead of him coming out to theirs, which is terrible. Um, and then they had the match. I didn't care about the match at all. They're leading. I don't know if this is a feud, but it shouldn't be, all right? Because they did tease the Mi Chin B Fab thing. They kind of teased it a little bit. And I'm, I'm not looking forward to that at all. That sounds like it's going to be a disaster. Me and Yum wrestling B Fab, that sounds like a disaster. Even if it was a six person tag situation, it still sounds like it's going to be a heavyweight struggle of midness. And I'm not, I don't think anybody wants that. All right, they had the Grayson Waller effect on this show, which consisted of Asuka and EO Sky yelling at each other in Japanese. Now, because somebody is, the WWE Universe is expansive, somebody actually translated this. So apparently what ended up happening is EO said she was going to win the money in the bank. She called Asuka Miss Asuka. Asuka says that she's a child and she doesn't belong in the ring with her, to which uh, EO Sky called her a piece of shit and Asuka called her stupid. So that's apparently what they were doing when, of course, they had the crash and everybody from Bailey to Shotzi to Lacey Evans wearing a hilarious hat all stormed the ring to talk about the money in the bank situation. Now, uh, Lacey Evans, she comes out there, immediately gets the reaction because she's the only one apparently who knows how to because um, she addressed the audience first. She came out there, told the audience to salute her. They all booed. She was the only one who came out of the shoot and got a reaction. The only one. And <laughs> she hadn't been on TV in weeks. Um, and this led to her match with Zelina Vega in the Money in the Bank scenario, which we're going to talk about extensively in a minute. So, uh, Shotzi had come out there. Bailey had come out there. And Zelina Vega had come out there. So Zelina Vega says that she feels underestimated. And wants them to keep underestimating her as Rhea Ripley had underestimated her and nearly lost. And I'm just scratching my head because I'm thinking nearly doesn't count. Rhea Ripley beat you. So what if she underestimated you? She she beat you. <laughs> so so what? You know, uh, sorry. That, it, whatever. Anyway, Zelina Vega says that everybody's underestimating her. She's looking to go to Money in the Bank. This led to her match with uh, Lacey Evans. We'll talk about that in a second. But Zelina Vega, she's literally 
she's less than five feet tall. She's got to be. She's got to be like four foot ten or something like that. It is ridiculous how short this girl is. She might be. She's beautiful. She's gorgeous. Jesus Christ. She definitely did not deserve the disrespect that Austin Aries showed her by giving her a promise ring like she was 17 and they were in high school. You know, that garden gnome definitely should have locked that up quickly as possible and knocked it up, shot, I mean, just shot up the gym. Like, you know, I'm not, I shouldn't say that. I, I shouldn't say stuff like that. But anyway, they should have babies right now. But he, he dropped the ball. She's absolutely gorgeous. But as a wrestler, she's very small. She see, she gives a good reason why they probably need to be weight classes in the female division too, you know? Like her and Liv Morgan and Alexa Bliss, they're so tiny. EO, she's tiny. They're tiny girls. Tiny girls. They're really, really small girls. That you can't take them seriously as a threat. They're, it's not just that they're short. It's that they're small, all right? Nikki Cross is short. But she's not really small. She's kind of stout. Um, but she's little and skinny, and her her office doesn't look very good. It doesn't look very convincing. And so you're sitting there racking your brain about this. Like why is why is this? Why is this happening? Um, the EO Oscar segment is always funny to watch them yell at each other in Japanese. Uh, Oscar looks like a demon for some reason. She looks like uh, she's possessed, which might be a good look for her character. Um, the various other people who came out there are not really of mention except Bailey and Bailey's just in this situation where she probably needs to take a break, um, so that she can come back as a main eventer and not as just another face in the crowd. Poor, poor auntie Pam, poor auntie Pam. We love you. Please go on vacation or something for like four weeks and then come back reinvigorated with no damage control garbage. And maybe we'll can rediscuss uh, this thing. Um, other than that, Bianca Belair attacked Oscar for poking her in the eyes with missed hands on night of champions. They ended up getting separated by the referees and officials, etc. Um, I didn't mention this before, but since we're talking about Bianca Belair, the ridiculous Nick Cannon rap thing that happened where her and Montez Ford were on wild and out. And Nick Cannon said that he would impregnate her in front of Montez Ford. Um, hmm. I know a lot of people kind of wave the hand of that saying, Oh, she knew it was going to be said. It was wild and out. They go through all this stuff beforehand. Uh, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about that one, dog. I'm sorry. Uh, may, you're insecure, Mongo. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I ought to beat that nigga to death with his own turban. Who the hell, who the hell is Nick Cannon? Fuck Nick Cannon! As quoted by Dave Chappelle. Anyway. Uh, disrespect. I don't know why Montez Forrest put us with it. But he's got to. He's got to learn how to fight. Because Bianca is fine. So he's better learn how. He better take a boxing class or something like that. Because that girl knows. <laughs> that girl fine. So everybody's going to be trying to steal her from him. All right, so this leads to the Money in the Bank scenario where we had our two Money in the Bank matches, which was the first one was Lacey Evans versus Zelina Vega. Lacey Evans was dominating the match physically because she could. Zelina Vega ends up winning with a surprise counter roll-up thing. Uh, very unfortunate for Lacey Evans, um, who I think has tremendous amount of potential, and they haven't tapped into it. This character works. She knows how to work the crowd and how to get a reaction. Um, Zelina Vega, I'm not sure, is a credible contender. It's just I'm not sure how that's going to work out. But it's a ladder match. So Zelina Vega is going to be in it. Okay, fine. They do a backstage segment where Santos Escobar is very proud of Zelina Vega. So is Rey Mysterio. They're talking about uh, the Latinos and how inspired the Latinos must be to see the LWO doing well. And then Santos Escobar says that he's going to win his match next week. That's going to uh, make them Mrs. and Mr. Money in the Bank. Then we had another Money in the Bank match, Montez Ford versus LA Knight, which featured Montez Ford actually getting booed. And people love Montez Ford, but they seem to love LA Knight a little bit more. LA Knight wins the match. It was a solid match, you know. It was a match that was for something, so it mattered. It was worth paying attention to. 
Uh, definitely feel like Montez Ford is going to get like a last chance battle Royal kind of thing. And he's going to end up in it and end up in this match. Anyway, I saw a lot of people in, in with a bad, had a really bad attitude about, <laughs> about Montez, uh, being in this match, considering he wasn't going to win it and it feels like he should be in the match anyway. Well, there's a lot of talent that probably won't be in the money in the bank match. Which just tells me they're probably going to do some kind of last chance battle royal or something like that that may give Montez an opportunity to slide in. Um, but if they do do that, then I think it's probably going to end up going to like Bronson Reed or something like that. But let's talk about the next Money in the Bank matches that they have set up because this is very interesting. On the men's side, it's Pete Dunne and Baron Corbin next week on SmackDown and Mustafa Ali and Santos Escobar. On the women's side, it's Bailey versus Mia Yim. And Shotzi versus EO. So I'm pretty sure that this means that, uh, now Baron Corbin, that's before we get into this too much. Um, he it, has been embroiled in this thing with Cameron Grimes. He attacked Cameron Grimes, then he went and attacked Carmelo Hayes on NXT. And they showed footage of him attacking Carmelo Hayes on NXT. And Cameron Grimes said that Carmelo is going to be able to handle him on NXT, but he's got to handle him on SmackDown. So I'm guessing. They're probably going to do a Cameron Grimes run in to cost Baron Corbin his match on SmackDown, which is probably going to put Pete Dunne in the ladder match. And he has no business being there. Neither one of these guys should be in this money in the bank match. If we being honest, uh, who the hell wants Baron Corbin in this match? Nobody. Pete Dunne has no business being in that match. Santos Escobar versus Mustafa Ali. Now Mustafa Ali uh, actually popped up on NXT too. He also got into it with some guys on NXT. So maybe there'll be another NXT run in. Now, considering this is a babyface versus babyface match, the best way to, I think to handle it would be to have some kind of heel interfere and cost somebody to match. And since Mustafa Ali is the one who's in a storyline right now, I can see that being him. Now, Shotzi versus EO Sky. That's an interesting one. Of course, EO is going to dog walk <laughs> Shotzi. Um, but ladder matches seems more like a Shotzi thing, you know. Um, but we've seen her in ladder matches before and she underperformed. So she's not going to get the opportunity this year unless it's like a battle royal or something like that. Now, Bailey versus Mia Yim is interesting because it literally could go either way. Now, clearly, Mia Yim is going to lose this match, but. There, there is an argument to be made where Bailey doesn't need to be in the Money in the Bank match at all, and perhaps it may make more sense to put Mia Yim in it um, as a way of at least elevating her. Now, why you would want to do that, I don't know, but there is an argument to be made that Bailey doesn't need to be in the Money in the Bank match, but you have to put somebody with some legitimacy in it in order for it to make sense, right? So we're going to go with that. I'm guessing, looking at this setup so far, I know that there's six, but I'm making a decision based off of what I know is going to be in it so far. I really do think that EO is going to win the money in the bank. I didn't really think about that at the time when I was saying, I don't know who's going to win the women's money in the bank. I think having EO and Asuka argue in the middle of the ring already is going to lead to EO versus Asuka and some kind of pay-per-view match. And I think that's probably for the best. You know, Triple H is a match guy. He's not really a storyline guy. And since that seems to be a match that makes sense and they've already teased it, they teased it more than once already. I think that they're going to go ahead and go with that. I guess on the men's side, it would make sense to go with LA Knight. I don't know. LA Knight is super over right now. They don't have a lot of time in order to uh, play around with the push. But... I don't know if you take LA Knight from being a jabroni to being Mr. Money in the Bank overnight. You know, I don't know if we go that far, but it's worth it, I guess. It's worth an opportunity. It's worth uh, a thought, at least. But I'm looking at the men's side and saying to myself, bro, I don't have any idea. It's a toss up. But I could see EO winning it for the girls, maybe LA Knight for the guys. But I'm not really pulling for anybody um, in particular. Um, to continue, just sort of finish out this segment. This is the second time that uh, Grayson Waller has done a Grayson Waller effect and essentially been pretty mild. He, he's been very much toned down 
since his NXT presentation when he was treated like a big star. Now he gets a big star introduction with the uh, the dynamite from down under, the Aussie icon. But it's like, mm, maybe we ought to build to a match or something that he's going to be doing rather than him doing random segments. And then he also needs to get some heat in these segments. You know, instead of being mildly annoying, he's give, be given an opportunity to build up some heat. So just in case somebody decides they want to beat him up or put their hands on him or you want to build to a fight or something like that, there's some heat there. Um, they're really dropping the ball with Grayson Waller. And he's, he, I wouldn't say he's old, but he's older than most NXT talents. He's like 32 or something like that already. You don't have a lot of time. Like, that's the thing. Like, with people who are already seasoned, Escobar, uh, Bronson Reed, some of these guys are already in their 30s. You don't have a lot of time with them. You know, Karrion Cross is almost 40, if not already 40. You don't have a lot of time with these people. You need to start getting things in motion now. You know, the whole Drew McIntyre, whatever is going on with him, they need to go ahead and figure that out. So, you know, you can have more people populate the main event and get more over. Because what the hell are you really going to do in a few years when Roman is gone? You know, and by then, Cody would probably be like some kind of part timer or whatever. You know, and Brock Lesnar may be gone. So what are you going to do? You need to start positioning people now. So the last thing was a video of the Unholy Union, which was Fire and Dawn. They did a vignette for them, which some people have taken to believe is a tease of Bray Wyatt. I don't know why you would think it was a Bray Wyatt tease. It's literally Baphomet heads burning people and other sorts of witchcraft. Um, yes, I know that Bray Wyatt was doing witchcraft in his storyline, too. But there is no reason to believe that these two things are related. It was just a cool video, you know, for uh, the Unholy Union. That's the name of their tag team. I don't see the problem here. It's not a Bray. Every, not everything that has dark and wizardry in WWE is going to be revolving around Undertaker or Bray Wyatt. I just I know it that you probably think that it should, but it doesn't. Um, Bray Wyatt is not around. I don't know if he had another mental breakdown. I'm not sure what's going on. But ultimately, um, he's not around and these girls need to get over on their own. So they just put together another video for them. And uh, it was fine um, if you're into that sort of thing. So overall, SmackDown was not terrible. Um, It was okay. It was entertaining. The Bloodline stuff was great. Uh, The Money in the Bank stuff is starting to take shape. But... And so LA Knight versus Montez Ford was okay. We'd like to see a little bit more, like a second layer of stories going on here um, with Austin Theory and Sheamus. Maybe some more segments instead of a really, really long match. Um, Asuka, you know, and Bianca having more than them two tussling right there. Or probably needed to be a little bit more than that. But they touched on pretty much everything. You know, they didn't leave anything in the dust except Karrion Cross and his tarot cards. And now all of a sudden he's not interested in AJ Styles anymore. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing with that guy, man. It's unfortunate for him, but I don't know what the hell they're doing. Anyway, uh, like, share, subscribe. I think thank everybody for your time and I'll talk to you guys later.